Well, I think most people in Melbourne, including most people in the and the public housing estates and most migrant communities, are totally aware of how dangerous COVID-19 virus is. Most people in migrant communities, especially from who come originally from countries where there's a high level of COVID-19, have had their families overseas ravaged by the virus and some have lost family members. So there's there's not a lack of awareness. Now there may be parts of the community in every Anglo, non-Anglo, migrant, non-migrant um, communities where, you know, some of the conspiracy theories from the US have, you know, penetrated into communities via Facebook and so forth. Um, that will be a phenomenon in every community, but it's only a tiny, tiny number of people who might think the virus is some sort of conspiracy. The vast majority of people are concerned about the virus, but the way in which this lockdown happened in of the public housing estates in Melbourne of nine public housing towers and, and walk-ups in Melbourne, in Flemington and North Melbourne, was totally outrageous and I think totally counterproductive to a health response. My belief is that public health uh, measures which in, need to involve the whole of society work best when it's when there's a partnership between government and, and society, when there's a collective response, when you involve community leaders where people feel that they're part of combating the virus. This was something else again. No one else in Melbourne has experienced this and certainly not the skiers from the rich suburbs who came back from the Aspen ski fields uh, after attending a um, an event in the Aspen Ski Resort organised by a prominent Liberal Party member um, who then spread the virus around all of the um, rich suburbs in Melbourne. So there's no lockdown, not even a partial lockdown for those people, um, let alone this sort of lockdown for the public housing tenants. I think the public housing tenants are being scapegoated for stuff ups during the with the hotel quarantine program where um, the government contracted out to security guard companies I imagine they did it had to do it fairly rapidly they said it w within 24 hours and I know there are a lot of fast decisions being made in the context of how fast the virus is spreading but they set up the hotel quarantine in 24 hours but then those co companies they contracted to subcontracted to other companies and it sounds like there was no real quality control so there have been rumours for a long time about the problems in the hotel um, quarantine but you know, the it's gone on and on and on and has resulted in two big clusters uh, connected to two particular hotels. Um, so I think the public housing tenants are being scapegoated for, for that. And so, you know, the virus spreads so fast, it's spread into working class areas, probably from that source, but also other sources as well. And in the working class areas, including the public housing estates, there are high numbers of essential workers who work in warehouses, work in transport, work in um, the food work for the food giants, i.e., Coles and Woolworths or Aldi, um, work in at the airports, um, you know, work in hospitals and aged care homes, and also security guards. So there are a lot of people who work in jobs where you. Um, you can't work from home and they also work in a lot of jobs which are precarious and part-time. So, you know, that means um, pe these uh, people have been in a vulnerable situation already, not like the white-collar workers who might be able to sit at home and, and do their work at home. So that makes them vulnerable. And so whether it's from the security guards or, or cedar meets or one of the other um, flashpoints, um, the, this virus has got into working class areas after going through a period where there were very few cases within, within Victoria. So now there is a crisis and the government's panicking. I can understand them panicking and the health officials panicking, but this hard lockdown is going to be counterproductive. So basically, the police arrived at the housing estates 
at 4 p.m. as the Premier was making the announcement, they arrived with no interpreters, no advance warning so that people could stock up on supplies to tide them over, no, no health workers, no food packages, no nothing. So there was just this hundreds of police arriving at the estates and sealing off all of the entry and exit points. Some of the ha housing tenants who arrived downstairs um, just going about their ordinary business to work or to get uh, food or whatever thought there'd been a bomb scare or a murder or something on the estate. Um, they had no idea what was happening. And so people's lives were just shut down with no preparation or anything. I don't believe they would have done this in any of the affluent suburbs of Melbourne if this same out of control virus was there. They would not have done this with this um, lack of um, lack of notification, lack of preparation. And this has caused a really disastrous situation for the public housing tenants. So you have to picture these public housing towers, um, a lot of them would only be two bedroom uh, units, although there might be some that might be three bedroom. Um, they have no balconies. So it's not like they can go on the balcony to get a bit of fresh air. The upper levels are all sealed windows um, in order to stop anyone trying to commit suicide and jumping out. So it means there's no access to fresh air. There might be some people who um, might have up to five kids, including little kids, including kids who've got special needs um, in this um, in these flats, in, in a two-bedroom flat, who they're not allowed to take outside to walk around and the grass surrounding the housing estate because there's quite a big expanse of grass and green area out surrounding the housing estates. So they could easily go and exercise without coming in contact with other people. Um, and people, when eventually some food arrived, um, it was food that wasn't culturally appropriate. Um, you know, there was tins of tomatoes and pasta and a lot of, like, for example, African families probably, especially the more traditional African families, probably wouldn't be cooking with lots of canned food and that kind of thing. Um, so there are many, we heard, we've heard stories about pork being delivered to Muslim families. Um, yesterday the food bank arrived and provided 1,600 care packages but there's 3,000 people on the estates, not 1,600. I believe Royal Melbourne, Help, Royal Melbourne Hospital nurses only arrived today on the estate. So that's two days after the hard lockdown. There are people who've got aggressive cancers who are meant to have chemotherapy scheduled during this lockdown. They're I believe they've been told that they have to postpone that. These are people with aggressive cancers. There are people who work full time or part time or maybe in, um, you know, jobs, precarious jobs, who will probably lose those jobs as a result of this lockdown uh, because there's been no promise by the government that they will take action against any boss that tries to sack a worker who's um, tied up in this lockdown. There, there are just, I mean, people are sort of looking out the windows at people, other people in Flemington taking their dogs for walks or babies in prams or walking around in total freedom while they're locked down. Um, they go to the same schools and shops as other other members of the public. Um, it, it, there's a total double standard for the postcode. So say, for instance, the postcode that covers the Flemington public housing estate. Um, so that postcode has been declared a hotspot suburb. But that is, um, but that not everyone in that postcode was treated equally. So other residents in Flemington who don't live in the high rise were given until midnight to get supplies. And it's also true, a lot of those people also packed their cars and left that hotspot postcode code to live with family members outside the postcode. Um, but they were also allowed to stock up on medication or whatever. 
And those residents in Flemington outside the public housing estate are allowed to go outside for four reasons, for work or education, shop for um, supplies, um, medical care or compassionate care, and for exercise. And I don't see why the public housing tenants can't be on the same level of lockdown as the people in the, the community that they exist within in Flemington because they are all part of the same community. Um, I also think the police need to be replaced with healthcare workers. Um, and some of the demands of the tenants, so some of the, I'll just read out some of the demands of the tenants. The, the tenants are demanding that they're not stopped from leaving their homes for the four reasons, work or education, exercise, medical care, or caregiving or shopping for supplies. They're demanding the removal of all police officers from the buildings and a maximum two police officers present in their community. They, they're demanding that rent beginning from the 5th of July be waived until further notice and any residents who have automated payments be refunded immediately. They're demanding a testing station without a police presence within walking distance of all lockdown buildings. They're demanding transparency and immediate tr transfer of funds to the residents raised by other entities such as Victorian Trades Hall and other entities that are doing fundraising. So I think that it, those demands are totally fair enough, but there also are also probably other demands that could be added in terms of, um, you know, the rights of people with disability in the towers to be able to have their carers come in. Some people living in the care, in the towers have disabilities where they can't eat without the assistance of carers. There are also people who are addicted, have substance um, abuse issues, and they will be going through withdrawal without any medical help. Now, the government has promised that they will be providing this help, but you know, this is 3,000 residents. It's taken them this long to get the Royal Melbourne Health care workers into the um, into the tower blocks. So how much longer for all of the um, services to arrive? There were scenes of um, people arriving after receiving a desperate call for nappies. Um, someone, the friend of the person who made the desperate call arrived at the estate. They could see their friend on the other side of the locked glass door. The police said, no, you're not allowed to come in to give them the package. Um, so the friend asked if the police would hand over the package. The police rudely said, we're not a delivery service um, and refused to deliver to the person who only had two nappies left and was desperate about, um, you know, being able to have enough nappies um you know, um, supplied. So, you know, these are the desperate situations and I don't believe any other resident in Melbourne who doesn't live in these housing estates wouldn't find this absolutely appalling and inhumane and, and discriminatory and stigmatising. And I think for people who are saying the way in which this is implemented is fine, I think, are not experiencing this and are not thinking about the implications if this happened to them. And it's easy for someone with a leafy garden um, who's um, got access to, you know, getting supplies, even if they're not leaving home or is allowed out to go for a walk. It's easy for someone like that to say, yes, this hard lockdown is necessary. But the latest booklet, the booklet, which has been delivered only after 18 hours of hard lockdown and no communication to residents, describes this as a detention directive. Now, if you think about the hotel quarantine, that was described as quarantine. For these public housing tenants, it's being described as a detention directive. So it's not being described as a health response, it's being described in um, punitive policing terms. Um, so people do feel like they're being treated as criminals and as prisoners, and it's not their fault that the virus got out into the community, and these communities understand the seriousness of the virus, but they shouldn't be bearing such a massive cost 
And I think the way this is done is, is going to sow suspicion about some of the health measures and may mean that um, may set the public health response back rather than setting it forward. So what could be done better or what should be done now to sort of improve the situation? Well, I think the government should implement the public housing tenants' demands about being allowed out for the four reasons that the rest of us in hotspot suburbs are allowed out for and the removal of the vast bulk of the police officers from the um, from the towers, um, the waiving of uh, rent. Now, it looks like the government has... Uh, has indicated that it will waive rent for two weeks. Um, so it looks as if the tenants have won that demand. Um, they're demanding a testing station without a police presence within walking distance of the lockdown buildings. So that should happen. Um, there, need, there need to be rapidly uh, an involvement of the community leaders within each of the tower blocks and within each of the language groups um, the, a meeting of these people needs to be convened to urgently, if it hasn't happened already, um, to um, to communicate with residents and make sure that people are supplied with everything they need, including emergency medication supplies, which people are not able to go out and get. And uh, there possibly also need to be other um, measures which could be taken place, such as um, if someone in um, a flat is diagnosed with COVID-19 and the other people living in the flat with them uh, want to be put into quarantine somewhere else so that they can, um, so that they can, um, you know, not catch, not catch COVID-19, um, the government should be finding more um, public housing to put uh, put people in. There needs to be a lot more in terms of sanitary measures within um, within the public housing estate to um, clean the lifts frequently. Because at the moment, in the rest of the Melbourne, there are teams of people going around um, wiping down lamp posts, including lamp posts that no one would ever lean against that aren't touched very often. Um, so they've got people wandering around cleaning things down, both things that are touched frequently by lots of people and things that are rarely, if ever, touched by anybody. Um, and like there does need to be frequent cleaning. I think a lot of public housing tenants have been calling for more information in the a wide range of languages, not just the main language groups, but all of the different language groups um, that are represented in the in these um, residences, and much better cleaning regime. But also, the government should probably be um, setting up an emergency temporary laundries, um, like more emergency temporary laundries, because laundries are communal. And what is the government allowing people to wash their clothes? Or are they meant to go without being able to wash their clothes for um, a fortnight? And then also, I, I imagine some residences, um, some residents probably also have concerns about concerns about the air conditioning system in in the towers as well. Like, is COVID nineteen spread through the air conditioning system? I don't know. But there is a paper which has come out signed by a whole lot of scientists saying that there appears to be new uh, research pointing to it maybe being um, transmitted through air conditioning systems. I don't know. I'm no health expert, so I can't comment on that. But um, I think the government needs to be, um, you know, making sure they're, you know, doing adequate cleaning and so forth of the um, air conditioning systems, the, the government needs to go all out to provide people with everything they need. And also, I think they need to trust public housing tenants in the same way that they're trusting people living around them um, who may have the virus as well, and people living in other parts of Flemington, in private residences. And I think, I think the fact that the government is trusting other people but not trusting the public housing tenants 
to just limit their movements to these four reasons, I think is is really appalling. And, you know, I don't want to see the spread of this virus any more than anyone else wants to see it spread. But I think, I just think this demonising of people is not going to take the public health response any further forward. It will set it back. One thing we have to remember, and this is why the public housing tenants are asking for the removal of all police officers from the buildings and a maximum of two police officers present in their community. And this is because the police have a terrible reputation for their harassment of black youth, especially male black youth. So, you know, the police officers in this this particular command um, covering this area, routinely stop any young black male walking along the footpath, or especially a group of young black males. Might be brothers, might be friends. Um, other young men are not subject to this level of harassment. Sometimes the harassment stop, steps up to the point of view of physical harassment, physical pushing around, or even worse, bashing up. This, the rate at which the police were harassing the local community led the Flemington and Kensington Community Legal Centre to take a charge, a case against police of racial profiling. That case took a lot of years, but it, the police were found guilty of racial profiling. And then in 2017, when there was a nearby protest organised by people in the left and anti-racist movement against a right-wing racist figure called Milo Yiannopoulos, which attracted some of the far right and nasty kind of violent characters, um, which, you know, he'd hired a hall close to um, close to the uh, uh, Racecourse Road apartment and public housing complex. And the far right initiated a fight and started verbally abusing the public housing tenants who didn't even know about the protests. They just came down to watch and see what was happening. And then they were abused by um, the far right. And the police response to that, even though it was started by the far right, and I think they might have even arrested or detained for a short while one of the far right characters, but the police basically... Um, went on a reign of terror against the public housing tenants on that night for hours and hours, chasing young black men through the public housing complex in using tear gas on children, children as young as six, who just happened to come down with their parents to see what it was all about. And obviously a lot of the public housing tenants did relate to the anti-racism message of the anti-racism protesters and there are quite a number of um, uh, of people of colour amongst the public housing tenants and, and some Muslims amongst the public housing tenants and that's what led to the their very physical presence led to the far right attacking them really aggressively verbally and the police took the side of the far right and they attacked the public housing tenants until late at night. Um, and some of the older um, migrant residents were trying to hose things down and the police were not willing to talk to those people and they roughed a lot of people up and some people were charged. But this was um, deliberate victimisation in people's place of residence by the police. And so, you know, people have memory of that on this estate and so you know, the police, the way the police have handled things has been terrible as well. And hearing a tweet from uh, one of the housing residents in the Flemington estate late last night, where the way the police communicated with them to tell them that the lockdown, the hard lockdown was extended from five days to 14 days, was the door being kicked on, not kicked down, but kicked and then an announcement through the door saying the lockdown's been extended till the 14th of July, uh, sorry, to, and for 14 days. So, like, that, you know, like, no wonder people want the police removed from the estates. These are not people who've got any kind of cultural sensitivity or sensitivity 
towards people who are going through struggles in life. Um, so, you know, I can understand the residents wanting the police removed, and I think the police should be removed and replaced with health healthcare workers. Thanks for joining us on Green Left TV. It's going to make a big difference if you can give us a thumbs up, like this video, subscribe and share it, and also uh, please become a Green Left supporter. Link is in the description. Thank <laughs> you.